So what politicians have done with the community leader aspect is, as you rightly pointed out, there's this tendency that those who are deemed as community leaders invariably are the religious leaders within the community. Now, forgive me for pointing out, but I can guarantee you the vast majority of Muslims in the world, especially in the West, but even in the world outside of those countries like Saudi Arabia and Iran, where praying is perhaps enforced, but certainly in those countries like Pakistan, where it's not enforced by law, but still one is expected to pray, the vast majority of Muslims do not pray five times a day. What does that tell us about their attitudes when it comes to elections in countries like Pakistan? The Jamaat Islami, the kind of Muslim Brotherhood of Pakistan, has never won an outright election, right? So what's going on when politicians go into Muslim communities, a bit like neo-Orientalists, you know, bigotry of low expectations, and think somehow that when a Muslim wants to express themselves, that they must automatically want to do so through their local religious leader, who is invariably the least educated within the community, who has the worst track record on gender rights, on homophobia issues, who really doesn't understand the world, but somehow the politician is pandering to this guy for votes. So there's a self-reinforcement cycle going on here. And actually, I can assure you that uh, most Muslims in this country would rather speak as women, as husbands, as fathers, as mothers, as educationalists, as doctors, as nurses, as street cleaners, as whatever they are, because they have multiple identities. And it's high time that our politicians recognized that we are not uh, unilateral, sorry, uh, sort of one-dimensional creatures who can only ever speak as Muslims and who only ever want to be identified as Muslims. And so there's that form of... There's that form of bigotry of low expectation. Imagine, fi finally, sorry, on that point of the Reformation, very quickly on this one, because I know I took a lot of time on that last question, that Reformation and whether it's possible. Yes, uh, the Protestant Reformation was incredibly bloody. Um, you know, there, was, there were wars, a lot of people were massacred. And even in fact, you know, we now look back in history and say, thank God that the Protestant Reformation happened. Well, the, the Protestants also massacred a whole bunch of people. You know, in Germany, the peasants, they killed them en masse, right? So their hands weren't, you know, uh, uh, blood free. They, they engaged in a lot of murder. And so in a sense, when we see what's happening with ISIS today, people say, where's the Muslim reform? And I use the word reform so as to not, not say that we're going to replicate the Reformation, which has a particular Christian context to it. But where's the Muslim reform? Well, actually, part of the fact, the proof that we're in it is what ISIS is doing. Those bloody wars are... Uh, uh, largely young men who are feeling threatened by modernity and the challenges that modernity poses to a literalist, vacuous understanding of religion. So they've decided to insist that it's always been like this and we're going to enforce it exactly like this and if you don't like it, we're going to kill you. So we're in the middle of it as well. Um, but one of the only ways I think we're going to avoid some of those mistakes and ensure the success of the Muslim Reform Project is we require allies from public, from society, but also from within governments. And that touches on some of the stuff I said in my last answer as well. We don't have religious freedom in this country, really, in the sense that Jews can't walk around sacrificing goats, Christians can't walk around burning witches, and Muslims cannot you know, uh, beat their wives if they're uh, disobedient. And that is from the Quran, by the way, like Majid, I've memorized a bit of it. So, given that, um, we don't really have it, but there's one thing we do allow in the name of religious freedom, which is religious dress. So women are allowed to wear the niqab, the burqa, the hijab even, right? And we, we do this because we say, okay, this is, your, this is your religious right, this is your religious freedom to wear this. What we do by saying this is we legitimize an interpretation of Islam which says the woman's hair is an, ob is, an, is an object to be fetishized, to be hidden, to be sexualized. We legitimize that, and we call that modesty. And by doing that, all Muslim women who don't wear the veil, like our very own Rahil Raza over there, become outside of that modesty. They become immodest. At worst, they become whores, or you know, these horrible, dirty words are applied to these women. I think that the hijab, the burqa, are harmful enough to legitimize banning them based on that very same principle. That what you're saying is, if you don't wear it, you're a whore. Could you please tell me what you think of that? Thank you.
the niqab and burqa are very clearly Islamic symbols which are connected to a political agenda. And this has been presented to Muslim women as a boxed and packaged form of Islam, that if you step out of this, you're not considered a credible Muslim. You should read on the blog my story about how BBC had approached me to give a comment as a Muslim woman, and then they saw my picture on my website and decided I wasn't a good enough Muslim woman because I wasn't covered. And so uh, you're absolutely right. So in Canada, what we did, my organization, Muslims Facing Tomorrow, lobbied our government, who did the previous government, who had our year. And we are working on a show your face law. We don't use the term niqab or burqa, but essentially we say that showing your face in public space should be a requirement, which in other words means ban the burqa and the niqab. Two other things. About the thing about political courage and also about the hijab, I've got to tell you this story. 13 years ago or so now, whenever it was when France first banned the uh, headscarf in public buildings. I remember doing a BBC discussion with a, 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 a left-wing politician who will remain nameless, and uh, a, a, an Iranian journalist friend of mine uh, uh, who, uh, who, um, who, who is far more hardline than me on some of these questions. And uh, the question was on this. I said, well, you know, the French state has the right to do this when, you know, when people say, who is the French government? Well, they are the government of the Republic of France, and, you know, one can agree or disagree, but they do have that right. And um, um, anyhow, uh, uh, the, the Labour politicians spent the entire program uh, uh, lamming into me and my uh, uh, Muslim Iranian colleague for, uh, for our stance. We were called Islamophobes, everything else. The usual, what one was going to get used to in the years ahead. But I'll never forget that when we exited the studio, uh, this person clapped me on the back and said, uh, Never forget, Douglas, we're all with you. <laughs> and, and I said, uh, well, what about the half hour live on air we just, we, we just had, which was the more pertinent moment to make any such support felt? And the reply was straightforward. He said, you've got to understand I've got a very large Muslim constituency. To which my Iranian friend said in one of the most beautifully polite Persian things, devastating things I've ever heard, said, ah, I see, you are a coward. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow. Majid, um, I'm an um, atheist from a sort of Islamic background, technically from, from an apostate cult, but never mind. Um, <laughs> The question that I have for you really is that the overwhelming majority of my moderate Muslim friends, and I genuinely mean that they're moderate, they're, they're not sort of practicing, they're not that committed, they're pretty relaxed about it. They hate you with a passion and they hate the reformers within Islamic circles with such vitriol and passion that I just find genuinely bizarre. Um, why is that, firstly? Um, I, I can tell you what they tell me about Muslim reformers. They think that they're all sellouts or Mossad agents or something of that sort. But what's your take on it? Majid, Majid would you care to explain why you're so universally hated? Uh, exactly. uh, okay, right. So listen, there's, there's a danger here that this particular uh, uh, question takes a life of its own and becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, because you notice what just happened. The questioner didn't say universally hated, and that's how it got interpreted, yeah, right? right? We've got to be very careful. You're going to get me killed. We've got to be very careful. No, I'm not even joking. We've got to be very careful. Because actually, the sort of people that hate me are, of course, the Islamists, of course, the fundamentalists. And then what was described as moderate Muslims who behave moderately, yet don't like what I say. I would question, sir, whether they are moderate. I know you think they are. But actually, even ISIS, Al-Qaeda considers ISIS extreme today, right? <laughs> What does that tell you about the spectrum of opinion? When 50%, over 50% of Britain's Muslims, when asked, said yes, being homosexual should be made illegal. I suspect you're hearing from that same 50% who hate me. But there's another 50% that don't, but by definition they're not vocal, because by definition they haven't gone out there to define themselves as Muslim and engage with the public as Muslims. They're not wearing Islam on their sleeve. But obviously, because of what I say, I have to come, uh, 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 come uh, um, against those who are wearing Islam on their sleeve, for whom Islam is their primary identity. So when they hear me criticize the notion of Islam being your primary identity, of course it's going to upset them. I'll tell you a small story, a little anecdote. 
When I was uh, around 17 years old and I first became an Islamist a year earlier and I joined Hizb al-Tahrir and I remember standing outside a mosque one day distributing a flyer that literally said the Prophet Muhammad was involved in politics. Help us re-establish the caliphate. That was the title of the flyer. And as a young Hizb al-Tahrir lad, I was distributing this outside a mosque. Out walked a big, like a lot bigger than me, older than me, bearded religious Muslim with a prayer cap and walked straight up to me and punched me in the face, <laughs> right? And he said, how dare you defile our religion by bringing into it politics? This is when I was 17 years old. Fast forward, and I've traveled a lot around the world to challenge extremism, including in Pakistan, where I went to, uh, the week that M Malala was shot in the head, I went to Mengora, the town where she was shot, and organized a public protest against the Taliban in that town. I've also been to Quetta, which was the headquarters of the Taliban, and organized a huge rally, which Newsnight filmed, with thousands of Balochi students in the university and me speaking against the Islamist theocrats. On that trip in Pakistan, I was sitting in a cafe, having a, a, a coffee, minding my own business, and up walks a bearded Muslim and punches me in the face. <laughs> and this time he says, how dare you promote secularism in the Muslim countries? And last but not the least, Majid, you don't have the monopoly on being hated. Uh, it, <laughs> it comes in many ways and forms, and I will just end on a very uh, fine anecdote here about uh, the latest hate mail that I got was, uh, you know, you terrible uh, four-letter words, uh, Zionist agent, you must be living in a mansion, amount of money that is being paid to you to do all of this. And I wrote back and I said, you know, from my two-bedroom apartment, I'm looking down at my high end eye and wishing that the Zionists would really listen to you and provide that final thing. So thank you very much. <laughs>